name is Ben Sigelman, and I'm here to talk about cloud native observability done right at the WTF SRE conference. Um, my um, background uh, spent my first nine years or so uh, out of college at Google, where I worked on a variety of things. So I spent most of that time working on what we would now call observability and created their um, Dapper and Monarch projects, which were their distributed tracing and high availability metrics monitoring systems, uh, respectively. After leaving Google, I uh, co-founded Lightstep um, and created a couple of open source projects in the space as well, open tracing and then open telemetry, um, which is an evolution of open tracing. And all of this stuff uh, will be relevant um, uh, to what we're about to talk about. So I've got a lot to say, so let's just get right into it. All right, so the first thing I want to do is to set the stage with um, some important concepts. And in my mind, these are the fundamental building blocks for thinking about observability, um, the resources and transactions. Okay, so let's talk about what these things actually are. Um, in this diagram, you can see um, some uh, little blue boxes here that represent different types of resources. Resources um, can vary in size and scope. Um, you could have a resource like a microservice, a resource as big as a Kafka cluster, or a resource as small as an individual mutex lock. This is just a reusable concept. And uh, resources can be described by their tags um, that help identify them and let you slice and dice the resources in different ways as you're analyzing them, and they can be consumed. What consumes them? Transactions. And transactions are the things that actually do work in your application. So um, no one who's actually using a piece of software or cloud native software as an end user or as a customer really cares about your resources. What they care about is their transactions. Those are the things that usually start with a client somewhere, whether it's an SDK or a mobile device or a web browser, and um, propagate throughout many different resources at many different levels of granularity before eventually coming back and completing their work. Um, transactions uh, and resources are the two fundamental building blocks uh, for the work that is done uh, in any cloud native application. And um, like resources, transactions can also be described at many different scales. You can talk about the HTTP calls, you can talk about function calls, you could even get to talking about individual CPU instructions. Those are all viable ways to model the work of a transaction, although they're not all viable ways to collect um, data about a transaction in a high performance, like sustainable way. But you can think about the transaction operating at many different levels of granularity as well. Okay, so two fundamental concepts. Um, in uh, transactions, um, uh, you can also describe the work that's being done with attributes or tags. Uh, for instance, you might want to tag a transaction with the customer that initiated the transaction or the environment that it's touching or the machines that it's touching. And those tags can actually join over to tags on the resources to help understand um, the correlations between transactions and resources because transactions don't do any work without resources um, and uh, resources aren't consumed without transactions. Okay, great. Uh, so let's move on. Um, these two things are completely codependent. But by that, what I mean is that your end users literally only care about transactions. That's the only thing that matters to them. Um, but operators or engineers only have control over resources. And, um, and so the, the, um, the resources and the transactions are totally codependent. And the um, end users and the operators are also um, totally codependent. So by that, I mean, as an engineer, as a good engineer, you care about your end user, but the only thing you can actually control is a resource. What the end user actually does, the transaction is something that you can hope for and you can measure in certain ways, which we'll talk about, but you can't really directly control it. The only, only thing you can directly control is, you know, which code is shipped where and um, how many of them are running, which again are resources. Okay. So hopefully um, that describes these two concepts, which, which we'll come back to as we, uh, as we go through um, the rest of this material. So um, let's talk about the promise of cloud native as well as the, I think the disappointment of cloud native. Um, so the, the promise of cloud native um, really honestly doesn't have a whole lot to do with um, cloud. It is really more about velocity for um, software development. Uh, what happened is that we realized that software is an important aspect of you know, generating revenue and innovating. 
And so we hired a ton of engineers, often thousands of engineers, and then we tried to make them productive. And you can't get more than you know, 15 or so engineers to work on a single piece of deployable software before you start hitting some fundamental communication bottlenecks in the software development lifecycle. And so what we do is we split that um, application, that larger you know, business application up into individual services that are uh, you know, built, uh, deployed, operated, maintained, et cetera, by small teams of developers or DevOps engineers. So you have these teams that are developing and operating on the left. They're um, you know, pretty tightly coupled to services that are on the right. And then um, cloud native allows for parallelization of change and innovation. And that's the vision. And I would say, you know, to large, in large part, that's actually happened. There's some great talks about this that get into details. Sarah Wells at Financial Times has done some talks I really like and often cite showing what Financial Times is able to achieve in terms of CICD improvements from moving to a monolithic environment to microservices. And it's not like a 2x or a 3x difference. It's like an 100x difference in terms of how much change they're able to get into production. And that's awesome, right? But um, this, this um, independence, the independence of these changes is a mirage. Um, it is an illusion that these changes are not independent, not in the slightest. Um, in fact, if you have an operator at the bottom of the stack here making a code change and they commit the code, CICD picks it up, builds it, deploys it. And um, even if the service in question isn't literally broken, its behavior has changed. That's the whole point of making the code change. And if that change ends up having unintended side effects and negative side effects up the stack, um, that can often be magnified by intermediary services. You can have an unintended operational change elsewhere in the system. Okay, so let's pause for a second. So the idea with cloud native development is to parallelize change and we can definitely parallelize the change. Many light step customers deploy four or 5,000 times a month, um, but each one of those changes has side effects. And those side effects are often uh, in remote services uh, operated by remote teams that don't even know each other. So, and this diagram really doesn't do it justice. Um, microservice architectures often involve hundreds and sometimes thousands of these microservices. And I would argue that in those environments, there's not a single person on staff who really understands how the whole thing works anymore. That's kind of by design. That was the parallelization we were talking about. But the result is that the person receiving the operational change, that's a really nice way of saying, getting woken up in the morning and saying WTF, <laughs> WTF is SRE. This SRE or DevOps engineer or what have you um, often has no idea uh, who this person is or what they were doing, right? So there's this force at a distance that happens. And this is why cloud native um, despite its advantages, uh, can be so problematic when it comes to understanding both planned changes and unplanned changes. Um, it's because of the distance that the, these changes um, and their side effects can travel in very short time, right? Um, and your changes and their side effects can traverse your org chart a lot faster than you can, and, and that is um, a big part of the problem as well. So um, having spoken about those two you know, sets of concepts, resources and, tra resources and transactions, and then um, how we think about cloud native development. Let's talk about the architecture of observability and um, open telemetry specifically. So um, observability, uh, this is sort of the conventional wisdom. Um, you've got uh, some kind of logging system that you've had forever. I mean, logging has been around since the 1960s or something like that. Uh, you almost certainly also have infrastructure metrics that are drawing squiggly lines somewhere in a dashboard um, and probably also have some application metrics, red metrics, uh, drawing other squiggly lines and other dashboards. Uh, and then maybe now that you're doing distributed stuff, you realize that you actually need to do distributed tracing. And so there's some kind of sidecar project doing distributed tracing um, and the whole thing is integrated, uh, but only in the sense that you have a web browser and you can you know, switch tabs or you buy from a vendor and you can switch to different pieces of the left nav to deal with these different types of data. But the integration is really pretty superficial. It's, um, it's at the level of, of the charts themselves and the widgets themselves and really no further than that. Um, this is totally wrong. Uh, if you take one thing away from my talk, it's that this is not the right architecture. <laughs> um, the right architecture uh, necessarily looks a lot different. Um, uh, than silos built on top of these data types. Metrics, logs, and, and traces or spans 
are certainly important aspects of the solution, but they are the raw data. They're not the products and they're definitely not the architecture, okay? So um, this is more how I think of it. Um, for a cloud native, um, the uh, architecture for observability um, fundamentally starts with telemetry. I've actually simplified it down to metrics and traces. People would consider this to be sort of provocative. You could argue that logs should be in here too, and I think that's fair. The reason I've left it out is that I really think of logs uh, in cloud native ought to be traces. I think the, the reference architecture in my mind is to get logs into traces. I was actually talking with a customer today who was able to reduce their logging volume by a very large factor by just moving logs about transactions into the spans themselves um, and uh, where they're actually a lot more valuable. Um, that's another talk and I've actually done it, but I, I won't repeat it here. But I think these are the types of data to really definitely get right. Um, you can throw logging in here too if you want, um, but in my mind, part of the goal of logging is actually to do less of it. Uh, it doesn't um, scale well in cloud native where you have too many services per transaction for logging to have effective ROI. These things need to go into some kind of unified data platform. And this is again where the previous diagram with the big cross through it, this is where that fails. Um, you really need to have a database that's capable of scalably representing both time series statistics for metrics and um, structured event data, whether you want to call that traces or structured logs with context is sort of an academic question, but you need to be able to store it, those two very different types of data and issue efficient queries using a common um, uh, query language and execution engine in order to join them together. If you think back to resources and transactions, you'll remember that we had the same tags on the transactions and the resources. Um, in the transactions, they're typically represented as traces or spans. The resources are typically representing data as statistical metrics. You have to be able to join those two things. And you can't do that join computationally unless you have a unified data platform. So the reason this is so important, again, goes back to that um, codependency between resources and transactions. You need to be able to understand those codependencies um, uh, and your observability system has to be able to do that automatically in a data platform. And then finally, um, there's, uh, you know, core monitoring um, over here and um, understanding change uh, over here. I think of these as the, the most important fundamental workflows. Uh, there's this idea of observability just being a new word for monitoring. It's really not true, but monitoring is not going anywhere. Monitoring is really important and is an aspect of observability. Monitoring is basically tying um, the, the it, it's a way of representing the relationship between the health of some aspect of your system and the health of the business or the application that it's a part of, right? So if you're on the bottom of the stack and the database layer, you do need to monitor the database CPU load because if that goes over, you know, whatever, 85, 90%, you're going to start seeing a lot of pushback and that's going to have a business effect, right? So you're, it's appropriate to monitor that resource and to understand how close you're getting to those thresholds. Um, uh, and it's because you're trying to get ahead of problems that in your resources that could affect the business. Um, the, the trick is that you do not want to use your monitoring tools to understand changes in your monitoring. If that line spikes and suddenly your CPU usage goes from 50 to 85% or worse to 95% and you're starting to really see saturation, um, at that point, if you're using the CPU graph to diagnose that, which you can kind of try to do if you want to segment things enough, um, you're going to be in a world of pain. You need to have tooling that's capable of, of dynamically guiding you through um, uh, understanding both those sorts of reactive changes as well as proactive changes. So by proactive change, I mean CICD really. You want to be able to understand how um, intentional changes to one part of the system have affected other parts of the system. And you want to be able to do that proactively, okay? Um, this is not meant to be a vendor pitch, but I, I will say this is basically LightSteps um, product architecture. And then you know our whole approach to this is to lead a lot in open telemetry, um, uh, focus on the scalability of the state of the platform because cloud native apps are often quite large. And I will also say that there's an enormous amount of waste, um, particularly around metrics. Um, we've done some studies and um, when we look at cloud native apps, because metrics are you know, used for monitoring and because monitoring is the devil people know, we're using cardinality and metrics to try and understand changes. What that means is if you see some kind of spike in a metric, 
you're going to want to do a group by to understand like where that spike came from. And you're going to group by some high cardinality tag, like a host name or worse, like a customer ID or something like that. Um, there are many of these tags out there. They're very expensive in a time series database. And what we've found when we've studied it, if you look at the queries of metrics data, um, I don't, I'm not talking about whether those queries are valuable, but just the queries themselves, it's the, less than 5% to less than 35 or 40% of that data is ever queried for any purpose. So you're literally, a majority of the, the data that's being collected is never even charted for any purpose. And there are, there are tags in that data that entire tags with you know potentially hundreds of thousands of values or millions of values that are also never queried for any purpose and that waste is it's it's such like it's such an easy win for the ROI um, but honestly a lot of vendors have not been very helpful about this because that's also their revenue stream so so there's a lot of opportunity to fix the ROI um, particularly for um, logs and metrics. Um, for tracing from the very get-go, and I helped to create Dapper at Google where we started with this, the data volume was so extreme um, that we had to build in some form of sampling from the start. And that's part of why tracing ends up being a higher ROI choice than logging for microservice applications. Um, so the, there's a lever in tracing that you can use. Hopefully sampling can be more than just uniform sampling, but tracing has a lever. Metrics today kind of doesn't, and it needs one very badly. So there's a lot of innovation to be done there. And then unification of this UX around these kind of core primitives, rather than having the UX unified around the data types of metrics and logs and tracing as separate products. That's the, the other thing that we need to see as an industry. Um, so I've talked a bit about open telemetry, and I want to dig into that, um, both the why of it and, you know, what is it, how do you get started, etc. Um, so, you know, why does anyone care about open telemetry? Um, I get, I don't get this question directly, but I think I get some offshoot of this question pretty frequently when I'm talking with people who aren't familiar with it. So I want to make sure I cover that. Um, th there are really three constituents that care about open telemetry, and it's helpful for all of them. Um, there are the customers and the end users. That's the most important one. And the reason that they like open telemetry is that it gives them a portable and performant way uh, with all of the usual goodness around open source software to get high quality data out of their cloud native software. Um, across the stack. And by across the stack, I mean, obviously there's their own application code and OTEL actually in you know, dynamic languages like um, you know, Python and, um, and JavaScript and Java and things like that, we can actually attach via a post compilation agent, much like a traditional APM vendor would. You don't even have to instrument your code to do this, right? Um, but uh, the stack also extends to the ecosystem around you. So all of the major cloud providers have adopted open telemetry at this point. You know what that means is that you know, if you're using AWS or something like that, the Amazon services are actually able to emit um, open telemetry compatible data and send it, you know, to the, in the direction of your choosing as a customer. And so again, you get visibility across the stack that you wrote yourself, as well as the stack that you're attached to through a set of common standards and protocols. Um, so, you know, that's a really important aspect of observability is understanding your dependencies um, and open telemetry helps with that. And then finally, for vendors, um, uh, observability vendors, I mean, um, historically in the kind of uh, good old days of APM, an observability vendor or an APM vendor would be spending 80 plus percent of their own R&D developing these agents, which were doing some of this work, but in a proprietary way. It just doesn't really scale for them for cloud native. There are too many technologies, too many languages, too many dependencies. Uh, and it's not even differentiated anymore. So vendors have also been very enthusiastic about open telemetry. In the early days of open tracing, there was actually a lot of resistance. But at this point, open telemetry is drowning in committers. I think there are over 3,000 committers, and it's one of the most active projects uh, in the cloud native world, only really behind Kubernetes at this point. Um, open telemetry has a ton of support from vendors because um, vendors all benefit when open telemetry gets out in the world because they can get high quality data um, from any customer without having to create a uh, lock-in. And, and um, uh, for vendors, that actually makes it much easier to get a customer excited because they're not taking as much risk. So all three of these parties are excited about open telemetry, and that's why it's been um, such a fast-growing project. Um, the early history, um, uh, LifeStep had a lot to do with um, creating open tracing, along with um, Yuri Shkuro, who started the Jaeger project. Uh, the um, Google Open Census project came out in 2018, a few years later, and um, these 
uh, projects then fused in 2019. I want to give the CNCF a lot of credit for making that happen. This was a very problematic thing. Open census and open tracing took slightly different approaches, but there's a lot of overlap. And having um, multiple standards covering the same thing in the same market is really problematic. So it was a years long effort to merge these things, but we have successfully done that and have now deprecated the uh, predecessor projects. And open telemetry actually has a broader scope than either open tracing or open census ever did. And um, that's been a really good thing. Um, and, you know, it was released in beta in 2020. And at this point is, um, you know, fully stable for tracing and for metrics and logs are in progress. Um, but as I'll talk about in a minute, open telemetry is a very decoupled project. So you can use the parts that you need and ignore the parts that you don't. Um, so the architecture, as I just said, is super, super decoupled. Um, there is a specification, which is a very formal kind of RSC style, internet RSC style document. Um, there's a specification for each signal type that's you know tracing data, logging data, metrics data. Um, there are APIs, which are very thin, um, very little code uh, for each language that's supported, of which there are many. Um, and then an SDK that implements the API in kind of a default way. You don't have to take the SDK if you don't want it. It's just something that does the right thing most of the time. Um, and then uh, there's a whole bunch of instrumentation. Some of that is in the Open Telemetry project, which you can find on GitHub. Um, but there's also enormous amounts of instrumentation that's elsewhere in the ecosystem. And that's sort of the whole point, is that Open Telemetry, because it's open source, can be built into the software that you actually use, um, and uh, and there's you know um, there's no harm in doing that, which you know you would never do for a commercial vendor or something like that, right? So the instrumentation is proliferate, um, and then uh, finally there's this collector, which is um, you definitely can take it or leave it. It's very handy though. It's a piece of software that you can run you know alongside your application in the same Kubernetes cluster or whatever um, that can ingest um, data in many formats and then. Um, it can egress it in many other formats. So it's kind of like a multiplexer for all this data. And it can be really helpful if you're doing a migration, which you almost certainly are in observability. Um, you can take data in one format and spit it out in like an open telemetry native format or in some other format and do that at pretty high scale. It's also effective for multiplexing the data across multiple vendors or observability providers. And, and that can also be really helpful for transitions. So the collector is a piece of software you actually run on its own and uh, separate from these other things that you would link into your own application processes or infrastructure. Um, so, you know, that's open telemetry, um, you know, in a nutshell. Oh, it looks like I have an issue with my build. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I could tell you where we are today, but I'm mindful of the fact that, you know, these talks are recorded and people often look at them. Open telemetry is such a fast moving project that I think um, what I'd recommend if you want to know where we are today is just to remember, you know, if there's one thing you remember is that open telemetry is a decoupled project. So it really depends on which aspect you're interested in. If you want to do like, you know, distributed tracing in Java, it's ultra, ultra stable. If you want to do open telemetry logging in Swift, it's probably not even implemented, right? So, so there's a question of what language are you talking about? What, you know, signal type are you talking about? Uh, and what are you trying to do? And if you go to open, opentelemetry.io, um, there's um, some resources at the top to understand the status and maturity of the project along this like multi-dimensional matrix. And you can just take what you need and leave the rest, uh, which is a beautiful thing about the project. So you don't need to take some huge dependency that's like monolithic. You can just take the parts that you need, even if it's just the proto files for um, the wire protocols that you want to integrate. Um, and, uh, and that's all good too. So open telemetry um, status, uh, I'd rather just help you realize, go to open telemetry IO and look for the status for the language or the um, environment that you're interested in. Um, all right, so uh, we're getting close to time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about tying the stuff into actual value, um, which means I have to do a live demo. Uh, I'm going to um, briefly uh, stop sharing and then start sharing again. Um, I have to admit, um, I really do not like doing anything that looks like a vendor pitch um, during a talk like this. And I really don't mean it that way um, at all, but I am going to show uh, Lightstep's product really just because um, it's, the, um, it's the simplest way for me to, to show you, uh, you know, what I think is important about observability. So, all right. Um, let's see. 
So I just want to show a couple of charts. So this is um, uh, a notebook in LightStep. Um, I'm sure you've seen collaborative notebooks before. Um, this is a, a way that people are able to uh, you know, investigate an incident um, or just explore their data in an ad hoc way uh, while keeping a record of their work. Um, this is something I created um, a while back. Uh, you know, here we have a metric query for um, CPU usage. Um, this is just demo data, but uh, you know, it's pretty typical sort of situation where you, you might see CPU utilization spiking. And if you want, you can break this thing down by host name or what have you. Um, this is the way that I, you know, I often see metrics dashboards looking. It is good to know that something is going wrong, but honestly, the CPU usage alone isn't going to tell you what happened. Um, what would be uh, a little bit more useful would be to say, you know, I actually, what I want to do is look at request latency for the same service um, and see whether there is some kind of periodicity to uh, the performance of the service. So here we have um, what, what it, um, how that appears if you're looking at metric data. And um, uh, for metric data, it's definitely possible to uh, look at, you know, in this case, we're actually taking a histogram and rendering it as a P95 and a P99. You can see how there's a blip in this data um, roughly every hour, and you can see that in the high percentile latency. And if I want to, I can you know, break that down by host. But the problem you have with metrics, as I was saying before, if you want to group by something that has high cardinality, the metric itself becomes very expensive. So if you wanted to group by customer, but you have you know, thousands or millions of customers, it's kind of a non-starter for metrics. Um, but then if you group by host, you'll often find that actually is not related to host. All the hosts are seeing the same issue. So host is not a useful thing to group by. Um, so um, the question in my mind is like, well, you know, what if your data layer is capable of performing these sorts of queries based on um, other data types? So um, if you can imagine a data store that allows you to do metric style queries where you have, you know, charts like this um, at scale, but instead is um, looking at this via um, tracing data, um, you know, I can I can issue a comparable query, see the same sort of stuff. This time I've actually I'm breaking it down by one of these higher cardinality tags. And unlike the metrics um, query I issued earlier, if I want to pivot from um, this view uh, of request latency to individual examples, I can just click on one of these uh, exemplar dots and understand what this particular transaction was doing. Um, so uh, the ability to go from um, you know, a, a chart to another chart with a group by um, is one thing. The ability to do it with high cardinality is another. And the ability to do that group by with high cardinality and then dig into specific examples, that's actually what uh, we need, I think, for observability is to allow for you know, ordinary monitoring primitives like these sorts of charts to be linked up to the transactional data um, that actually matters to customers. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, for cloud native observability to really um, like realize its full potential, we need to have that sort of flexibility um, built in at the data layer and in the workflows themselves. And, and that's you know, really what I, I see as um, the future for um, observability and for this space. So anyway, I hope this has been useful uh, for folks. Since this is a recorded talk, I can't take your questions right now, but you can find me on Twitter um, uh, as el underscore bhs, lbhs, and send me a DM. Uh, I'm always um, uh, open to feedback, and uh, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed the uh, enjoyed the talk. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.